Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. From installing a smart garage door opener to installing a bathroom faucet to removing a tree, The Home Depot believes you can do anything, especially the things we have how-to guides for. Visit homedepot.com for thousands of tips, workshops, and ideas for projects, big and small. The Home Depot app, how doers get more done. This week, we give you a few ideas on how to upgrade your fireplace. A lot of different ways you can make it look completely different. Also, we deal with a damaged window issue and porcelain tile floors. Advantages, disadvantages, we'll share that with you. Maintaining a concrete slab. Yeah, concrete is low maintenance, but in order to keep it looking good, there are a few things you need to do. And replacement window tips. There's still millions of homes out there that have obsolete windows. And there's a lot of questions about exactly what windows are best for replacement. And what about a simple solution, Joe? All right, Danny, I've got a fast fix for sagging gutters. Often at this time of year, people are clearing out their gutters after a long winter. They may have found the gutters pulled away from the house. So I've got a quick way to set those gutters back in place. Oh, that sounds good. We do need to keep those gutters clean. But while you're at it, maybe you can improve the way they function just a little bit. All right, let's get started. Joe, you know, even on our own personal projects, we run into That's right. a, a few problems. And uh, one of the challenges I'm having is keeping a mailbox vertical. Um, my mailbox... <laughs> Why is that? Somebody keeps backing into it They or keep what? knocking it down. Tomorrow, I'll be tackling my fourth restructuring of my mailbox and nobody ever knocks on the door and say yeah. oh by the way i just ran over and, and you know brutally mutilated your darn mailbox you know and i, I have this custom built thing that matches right. my house and all of that so you've been in the house two years and your mailbox has been knocked over four times four times four times maybe are you putting it in the same spot every time tomorrow i'm not <laughs> okay <laughs> finally, good it just i finally came around finally. To thinking you know that might not be the best spot for that mailbox <laughs> After four times, maybe I should move it. That's right. Because I want it to where when I drive up, I can, you know, open exactly, my, yeah. you know, I don't have to get out of the car and I can get it and everything like that. And, uh, of course, the mail person uh, wants me to put it on the other side of the road. So I'm pretty sure it's them that are knocking it down to prove the point. Yeah. You know, they're hitting it every now and then. But my video cameras won't quite capture it. It did capture the FedEx guy running over it one time. And, <laughs> right. Okay. And so I call and say, hey, just wanted to let you know, the you know, you, you, you ran over my mailbox twice. You ran over it and then you ran over it again <laughs> as you were leaving. Backed over it, then drove over yeah. it. Right? Is that FedEx ground or FedEx air? And I go, it was in a truck. I would assume it was ground. It wasn't an airplane that landed right. on your you know, but, but but I never I never could get them to respond. I never could get them to own up to it. And and the video was a little. I mean, you could clearly see the logo, right? But I couldn't see the uh, tag number or anything, so it wasn't any big deal. I put it back up. So, but I don't know who ran over it the last few times. Could be Sharon. So she's not <laughs> she's not caving in on that. But yeah. but anyway, that's that's one of my projects. What about you? What what kind of thing you're tackling this weekend? Well, my mailbox is leaning a little bit because of the <laughs> snow and the plows. But I might straighten that up because we have uh, you know when the plows come by and they're moving snow and it's wet snow, they put up a wake of snow that if it if you were standing there it would absolutely knock you out of your shoes. Oh, so after a few snow storms the mailboxes there are mailboxes scattered all over the, our town here in roxbury that are just blown off of the post mine's mm. pretty sturdy but it is leaning a little bit because you know that wake of wet snow has been hitting it all winter so I'll, I'll go and i'll straighten that up but you know the lawn is a mess you know we have branches down all over the place from trees and we have a gravel driveway and, and i have it plowed so you can just imagine what a plow will do to a gravel driveway. I put several hundred dollars worth of gravel down each spring, and then by the end of the winter, it's all plowed up into the woods. So oh, yeah. I, I have a friend with a tractor and a rake, so he'll pull it out and grade it back out. So I've got to have that done. You know, we're finally, it's the middle of March, I'm moving outside. We do get snow ordinarily up and through April, but it doesn't last very long. It's not much, so I'm definitely ready to get out. 
How's your lawn look? I know you guys had some storms blow through there, but do you, is yeah, a little lawn bit, a okay? lot of a lot of leaves. So um, I don't right. necessarily need to mow at this point. But since I got that <laughs> mowing, that's very funny. The, the idea, <laughs> mowing, my mower is still under a tarp. Yeah. <laughs> but mowing it, and I've got the super duper, you know, leaf gathering thing on the back Vacuum. of the mower. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, going over it, it'll just look so nice to get all of the leaves off. Yeah. And, yeah. and of course, we talk about here on the show about leaf management that, you know, some people say, oh, it's great mulch. Just let it, you know, die and go down in there. But it actually can create a mat that can kind of choke right. out the grass a little bit, suffocate so, the grass and breed bacterial diseases. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to get it all out. But I'll tell you what. If you get, I remember um, when I was a kid and, you know, the old fashioned get out there with the rakes and, you know, I had a lot of pine trees in my yard as I was growing up. So we had a lot of pine straw, but get out there with that rake and you've got a good metal rake or even some of the good fiberglass type rakes and you're really getting all of those leaves up and the tines of that rake are raking over the topsoil man that's pretty good to open yep. up that soil a little bit kind of dethatching a little bit you know from time to time that's exactly right and yep. um that does a yard a pretty good bit so i've got to do a little bit of that soon with the lawnmower and that should help out a lot in terms of really getting that yard to grow and and of course Course we have the pre-emergent, you know, weed killer and so forth that we're putting out right now so that it can start, you know, sinking in. Yeah, we've often talked about the importance of when you start mowing the lawn and, and aerating your lawn, but I don't know if we've talked much about dethatching. If you've not dethatched your lawn, you might not have to do it depending on your lawn and how many trees and everything else, but you should do it at least once every couple of years. And thatch is simply a buildup of dead plant material that falls down between the grass and covers the topsoil. And if you get enough of it, more than let's say three eighths or half inch, you can start suffocating the lawn a little bit and preventing new lawn from growing. So you can dethatch it, which is, you can just use a rake, but they do have dethatching rakes that you can either, large ones you can drag behind a tractor or ones you can just use manually. And that's all it does, just pulls that thatch up. It doesn't harm the lawn, but it pulls the thatch up and kind of frees it up and gets oxygen and the water down there. Because a a really thick layer of, of thatch will prevent the water from going down as well. So so, yeah, that's important if you can either use a rake or dethatching rake to loosen up that soil. And also, we, we talk a lot about aeration, and that's something that people, some, yeah. you know, I've, I've talked to homeowners about it, and they just, well, I've never done that. Why should I do that? And another, this is a great time of the year for that, to rent one of the machines that you can get very reasonably. And like we also say, hey, talk to your neighbors. Maybe you can share it yeah. with two or three people. A core aerator, it's called, yeah. Yeah, core aerator. And, you know, if you've played golf at some point in your life, you've You've gone out to the golf course and it looked like someone has vandalized the golf course with all these big plugs of dirt there. Well, that's what they've done. So if the golf course are managing their turf that way, certainly managing your yard works out very well. You can go to todayshomeowner.com and read all about it, see videos of exactly how to do it. You realize how easy it actually is. Hey, if you're just listening to today's homeowner for the first time, this is what we do. We like to talk a little bit at the start of the show and then we roll up our sleeves and really get busy answering your emails and your phone calls. We're going to get busy right now. Head down to Florida. Lisa is on the line. Hey, Lisa, welcome to the show, and tell us what's going on with this fireplace mantle you have. Well, I would like to remove it and replace it with a wood mantle, and I have no idea how to get it off the wall. It looks like it would be difficult. So I need your help. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'll tell you one thing I always ask myself when I'm starting to remove something. Do I want to save it? And that would be a question I would ask you. Are you trying to, I mean, I have, I'm looking at pictures of it right now. It's actually very, very attractive, probably cost a fair amount of money. Would you be looking at trying to salvage that? A lot of people are selling things online these days. Oh, that's true. I think it might be heavy to ship, but no, I'm not planning on reusing it. And I do think it's been there since the house was built. So maybe 20 years. Um, uh-huh. So mm-hmm. yeah. Well, um, it doesn't appear that the corbels, the supports, are mortared or are um cera- the, the ceramic tile it's just hard to know whether or not the ceramic tile goes behind that or not now it may not because it's very important that those corbels are supported well so a lot of times they will install those first and then tile up around them can you tell by looking at it yes i can tell that the corbel like they've been cemented to the tile, but the tiles definitely look like they were on first. All right. Well, either way, those tiles are not going to be presentable once you remove those. So, you know, once it's removed and what whatever type of wooden mantle you put on there, the supports need to 
cover that same footprint or, or be slightly larger in order to cover up the tiles that are, you know, without a doubt going to be a different color or have uh, glue residue on them or, or whatever. So that's something you'll have to consider. But as far as taking this up, the first thing you'll have to take the large mantle across the top up. If you're not planning on saving it, you can really, you know, almost use its sledgehammer to try to uh-huh. bump, bump it up. You're going to want to go up with it a little bit. And once you get the slightest little crease form there, then you can use um, something like a crowbar to kind of slip in on top of the corbel and turn it loose. Once you get start getting it to turn loose, it'll turn loose well. What I'd be concerned with is creating any damage to your wall or whatever you have on the hearth. Uh, on the floor, you'll have to make sure you protect it really well. I would suggest putting down a piece of plywood and a drop cloth there to help you in case you drop a section of that. But this is a pretty tough job and potentially a little dangerous because if it's as heavy as it looks, you might be, you might be talking about 200, 300 pounds here. And, um, that can, that can certainly inflict a little bit of damage to those, (laughs) to those (laughs) toes, those legs, fingers, and everything in between. So, You'd want to be careful with that, but it all depends on uh, how well they attached it and exactly the method that they did, but most likely it secured pretty well. Okay. See, and that's what I was concerned about, and I was thinking it definitely doesn't look like a one-person job. No, it doesn't at all, and I would proceed very cautiously with it, And uh, but if you, you know, the thing about it, if you're not planning on saving it, then you can start chipping away at it, and I'll tell you, one of these small, we always call them baby sledges, the little baby sledgehammer that's, you know, about 12 inches long um, is a lot m- more manageable than the large uh, traditional sledgehammers, and that might be just what you need, maybe a little cold chisel to chisel around it. And uh, that should that should allow you to kind of chisel away at it and get it out of there. Okay. Okay. Good advice. I appreciate that. Okay. After you get that nice wood mantle on there, we'd love to see a picture of it. <laughs> okay. We'll do. And then oh. see what I have to do when we get it off. I have no idea what's behind it, like you said. So it could be an adventure. Uh, I think it will be. Well, well, best of luck to you. And so glad that you were part of the show today. Okay. Thank you so much for letting uh, okay. me share. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Have a great weekend. Joe, what do you think on something like this? Because how would you attach those corbels if you were to install something like that, Joe? Because you wouldn't be able to, you know, with wood, a lot of times you can put screws through the front and then plug over them. But with a masonry material like this, uh, that's a little bit different. Also, I'm surprised that the tile does not go around it right. to actually help support it a little bit. Yeah, I think she'll discover how those mor- corbels are attached. And for listeners here, we're talking about a stone uh, shelf, mantle shelf. So, you know, it looks like it's about four inches thick and maybe five or six feet long. It has two carved stone corbels holding it up from below. But I think what you might find is there, there's an iron bracket behind that corbel that the corbel fits over and the iron bracket might be holding it up because you couldn't just mortar that corbel straight to the face of the tile surround and expect it to hold up that stone. Mm-hmm. But you're right, I think a sledgehammer hammering up to loosen it. What I would do is I'd clamp a two by four to fit between the corbels on the bottom of that shelf, then mm-hmm. hammer up on the two by four. First, it does two things. It'll hold those two pieces because it looks like it's two pieces of stone. It'll hold those two pieces together so one doesn't fall, and it won't be sending chips of stone everywhere as you're hitting it because you'll be hitting the two by four. By the way, you should be wearing eye protection, oh, hearing protection, yes. Oh, yes. and cover the floor with like plywood or something because when these stones fall, there's gonna be nothing to stop them. That's so right. You, yeah. you don't want to damage yeah. it, like you said. You don't want to damage the floor as well. But yeah, I mean, you're just gonna have to start tapping it, and hopefully, it'll just loosen it up where you might be able to pull the whole thing out as one piece. Yeah. That's, that's but the but other you thing know, you, you think about it when you're looking at these pictures. Man, this is a good-looking fireplace. Looks really nice. I mean, I understand, you know, maybe some people could see the wood and, you know, stained wood would kind of yeah. warm it up a little bit. And, yes, it would look different and, and not such a, you know, stone kind of a look to it. I think it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I would hate to go in there and do that. I, I almost, you know, another alternative I could have mentioned to Lisa is possibly staining the existing mantle. Yeah, you could do that. You know, you could actually darken it a little bit. And you're not going to make it look like wood, even though there are methods that you can get close. But it just, um, that's a tough one. You know, the mantle I, I showed you and shared with you, the anguish I had in putting it in my house. I know. I remember that. Like, um, you know, I was dealing with over 700 pounds. Yeah. And even though they were in separate pieces... 
It took a while for it to come in, so I, you know I progressed on the house and actually had my finished floor in. I had my walls in and things like this. And all of a sudden, I mean, I I actually never realized it was going to be solid stone. I mean, I I mean, cut out of right. solid stone. Right. I thought it would be like, okay, we got a little stone here, and the rest of it's uh, foam. <laughs> You know, Foam. and I could tuck, I could tuck one piece <laughs> under this arm and one piece. Man, oh man, we had dollies that we pulled in, right. and then I had to go to the auto parts store and buy a engine, a a hoist. Hoist, yeah. Then I took a four by six and built this big thing with four by six uh, oh legs under it, wow. secured it all off. All of this on top of my finished floor with plywood, drop cloths, and I'm sweating like crazy, saying, "I know I won't end up in the hospital tonight." <laughs> and so I, I have these straps around it, and I'm pulling this thing up, and and it's creaking and cracking, and I could just, I said, "Okay, this isn't good. This isn't good," you know. And but yeah. we got it in place, and it looks beautiful, and. It's the old one and done. No need for me to ever do that again. Good. D- didn't something crack though? Didn't wasn't there something? I had that... a tiny little piece on it that I'm uh, actually think uh, I have a repair kit for it, but you can't hardly see it. And right. I might just say, "Well, that's the character." You know, it needs a little character there. <laughs> yeah. You know, and uh, I might stay with that because I'm afraid it's one of those things you start trying to patch it, and you go, "Oh," and it gets bigger and bigger. And right. next thing you know. You, you've really got an eyesore on the whole thing, so I, I don't want to go that route right now. But a lot of people look at different ways of, um, especially if you have an old brick fireplace, you know, the face of it is just kind of out of date and so forth. we got a lot of videos online at todayshomeowner.com about whitewashing it or lime washing it. And I think you'd be amazed at how quickly you can change the look of a fireplace by simply doing that. You'd be surprised on on exactly what you can do. They're also installing tiles over it. We do that a lot. So a lot of information waiting on you at todayshomeowner.com. Coming up, we're going to talk about windows and replacement units, or can you repair existing windows? There's a lot to talk about there, so don't go anywhere. The sound of you doing is music to our ears. Order on the Home Depot app and get convenient delivery so you don't have to stop doing when you need something. The Home Depot app, how doers get more done. Today's homeowner is brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. It's time for our best new product segment brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. One of the big trends in recent years has been making kitchens at home look and function more like professional kitchens. And the Sioux Pro Style pull-down faucet from Kohler is a perfect example of that. In fact, the manufacturer claims that the high arc and unique exposed spring design will bring life to your inner shift while offering exceptional control and flexibility. The two function spray head features stream and sweep, a wide forceful spray that makes cleanup a lot easier and the magnetic docking arm keeps the spray head securely in place. The spray and spring head are detachable to make cleanup really easy and the ceramic disc valves exceed industry standards by two times so you'll get a lifetime of durable performance. And the faucet comes with quick disconnects and connect supply lines and a soap dispenser for very easy installation. Now for more information on this Kohler Sioux Pro Style single handle pull down sprayer faucet, log on to homedepot.com. That certainly is a big trend over the last few years is, you know, getting that more of a um, commercial look to kitchens. Right. Some yeah. some people like it, a lot of people like it, especially since cooking seems to be a bigger and bigger trend than ever before. Now it's time for our podcast question of the week. If you'd like to send us a question, we'd love to get it from you. And you can go to todayshomeowner.com slash podcast to send it to us. Erica in Huntington, California sends one in says, Hi, Danny, we're remodeling our home and are planning to replace a large flat picture window in the living room with either a bay window or a bow window. 
Do you know any reason why we should choose one over the other? Now, this is our very first remodeling project, and we're a little nervous, but we trust <laughs> your opinion. Thanks so much, and we love listening to you each weekend. Well, if you're starting off with a project like this as your first remodeling project, uh, a little ambitious and a little brave, because um, this is a, a fairly tricky project, Erica, because... Um, you know, first of all, uh, to describe the two types of window, um, you know, bay windows are traditionally three sections. You have one out that extends out maybe anything from 18 inches to three feet. And then you have the two, what's commonly called flanker windows on either side. Whereas a bow window, and, and a lot of times the bay windows, uh, the wall section goes down all the way to your floor system. Whereas a bow window a lot of times will extend out and sometimes it doesn't go all the way down and actually has a support under it on the outside. So similar looking, but a bit different. But Joe, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to say, regardless of um, Erica's uh, experience, uh, boy, this is a professional project that needs to be done. Oh yeah. I mean, this is not a job for, first of all, most people wouldn't even be able to lift these windows into place. But yeah, the, the biggest difference is that these are both projection windows, meaning they both extend out past the front of the house a little bit. That's right. Mm -hmm. Where um, uh, bay windows typically come either 30 degree bays or 45 degree bays. The 30 degree bays typically stick out maybe 13 or 14 inches and a 45 degree bay because it's at a steeper angle sticks out close to 20 inches. So if you've got a walkway and let's say in front of your house, you know, that might be a lot that might be projecting so far out. It's, it's going to obstruct the walkway. So that'd be one reason where a bow window projects very little. They both, by the way, have really beautiful interior Seats, yes, window seats, so you can sit there and, and have this panoramic view of the neighborhood. Um, bow windows come in many more sizes, and they can made up from four or five sash to, I've seen them, eight or nine sash, but they project as little as four inches, and depending how many windows you add. So, you know, if that's the case, you can get, you know, a window that only projects four to six inches, and, you know, in this way you have, um, you know, you don't have so much of an obstruction out in front of the house, which sometimes can be an issue. Well, also, you got to think about that roof area like you're just um, describing. If you have a bay window that extends out 20 or more inches, you might be getting um, out from underneath your overhang, which, of course, you can't do. Then you're getting into some roof work. Right. And, of course, if you're getting into some roof work, then you're you're really affecting the aesthetics of your home from the outside. I mean, because this is there's a lot of things to consider. Might even want to have a small uh, a little drawing made to give you a little depiction of what the effects it will have on the exterior of your home. And that can be done easily with a architectural designer just to kind of draft something up there. Or there's so many visuals visualizers online now you might even be able to take a picture download it and you know uh, kind of uh, put that image in to see exactly what it would look like it would be well worth that exercise uh, but um, as Joe said it makes a big difference on the especially the interior feel of a room it's yes. going to feel a lot larger than um, you've actually increased the square footage yeah, it really floods the interior with light. Mm -hmm. And if and Erica mentioned they're replacing a flat picture window. Um, well, if you like that look of the flat picture window, then I would definitely recommend the bay if you can squeeze it in. Because the bay window is essentially, as Danny said, it's three windows. But the middle window is essentially a, a picture window. It's smaller, right. but it's a uh -huh. picture window. Mm -hmm. And the two that angle back to the house can be either be casement windows, meaning they crank out, or they may double hung. So those would be operable windows where the, the center window will not be. That's a fixed sash. So you get the look of a picture window with the advantage of having these angled side windows. So I, I, I really like the look of bay windows myself. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. They're always a good effect and uh, just um, might want to check with some remodeling contractors in your area, get a few references from friends and neighbors and such uh, because uh, uh, remodeling contractors have installed a lot of these kind of windows. But another thing that we hear a lot about here on today's homeowner, window problems and window issues. Right now, Tracy is joining us from North Carolina to give us a, a little situation that he's having at his house. Tracy, welcome to the show and tell us about your window. There. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It's an honor to talk to you guys. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I bought this house about 10 years ago. It's an 04 model. It's got a double window in the bedroom with one of those oval windows on the top of it. Uh -huh. And it has those uh, vinyl slats in it in, mm -hmm. between the, in between the glass. And a couple of them have 
turned loose on the outer edge and has fallen down to the bottom. Yes, I, I, see, I see that in the photograph, Tracy. I see that now. There's a half round window that had what looked like part of the grill is like rays of the sun shooting out. And there are five of them, except two of them have fallen off. They're kind of in between the glass, you say? Yes, they're, uh, I guess you might oh. say, the, um, those are double-sided. Double pane? Yeah. I just wonder if that's uh, replaceable, fixable. Is the whole window unit one unit, or is it just the oval can be replaced? Yeah, I'm looking at the photograph, and it's two double-hung windows with a half-round window above it. And that those are three separate windows. I mean, it may have come as one unit. Um, the manufacturer joined them. It's, the term's called mold, mold them together, joined them together. So it may have been installed as one unit, um, but they are three separate units. But okay, so it's three separate units. Now what? Because you have the insulated glass, so you have two panes of glass, and the grill is in between the glass, yeah, it, once that the grill breaks off. I'm, I can't imagine why it would have broken off like that if it's in between. Um, but in any case, now what do you do? You can call a manufacturer. If you look in the very corner of the glass, you can usually see an etching with the manufacturer's name on it. I'd be really surprised if it wasn't there. Um, but even if it isn't, you can call a local glazier, someone who installs and fixes windows, and they would be able to let you know, come out and take a look at it and see if there's some way to get in there. If it is completely sealed, then there wouldn't be any way they'd have to remove the interior pane, fix it, then replace it and seal it, which they can do, you know, but it would require replacing that, removing and replacing that um, or reinstalling that interior pane of glass. So, so, Tracy, we're not talking about the entire frame, which is very important so right. that it actually does not interrupt or interfere with your siding on the outside or your drywall inside. It's actually just that half glass. Now, a lot of times they'll come out of course, they'll measure it closely. A lot of times, they'll actually take a piece of paper or cardboard and create a template out of it so that they can make sure they're getting the exact piece. They'll order that glass. They'll come out, and I'm telling you, they've got these little funny little tools, and those guys can pull that glass out, reinstall the new one uh, in just a short amount of time. Really not that much of a problem. And Tracy, I know that we often get calls from homeowners who the seal between the two panes of glass has been fractured somehow. And so air and moisture is getting in there and they get like fogging condensation in between the panes of glass. And they say, well, how can I repair that? Well, you can't repair it yourself, but a glazier will come out and take that window apart and put in a new seal and put in and replace or reinstall the glass. And that's the same person who can come out and repair this window for you. That sounds great. It makes me feel a whole lot better. It's, it's not, yeah. It shouldn't be that expensive. It's one of those things, too, that you know people probably won't notice it that much. But every time you go home and every time you leave, you probably see that little flaw up there. And uh, that's what happens a lot of times in, in living in a home like that. But uh, fortunately on this one, it'll be a fairly easy and inexpensive way to correct it. That sounds wonderful. A quick question. I hang a Christmas wreath on that window using suction cups. Yeah. Uh -huh. Me applying pressure on that suction cup, do you think that might have covered it? I doubt yeah. it. Um, you know, it's, it's, of course, you know, it's a good size window, so it does have a little bit of flexibility, but I wouldn't think that it would affect it like that. There's just something happens, some, uh, of course, you probably get some pretty intense heat there, you know, so it, whatever the, you know, the fastener or uh, what whatever they did to attach that a little spoke in the wheel there um, came loose. But I don't I don't think uh, that it would affect it very much. Joe, yeah, Tracy, think? I'm not sure it would either, but I'll also tell you, I wouldn't hang the wreath back there once they fix it, because what if that is the issue? What mm -hmm. if that, yeah. you know, or hang it from above the window or below the window or, mm -hmm. or someplace else? But yeah, I mean, would the weight of a suction cup with a wreath be pulling on that glazing on, on the window enough, the glass enough to cause those little spokes, the grill to fall? I'm not sure, but you certainly don't want to go through the expense and time of repairing it and then being right back where you started, right? Exactly. Yes, sir. Well, good luck with this. I'm sure you can get that repaired. Uh, we've got some phone calls tonight. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> okay. Okay, our pleasure, Trace. You take care, and you have a great weekend. You too, gentlemen. Thank you. That's a unique problem. You think about that window and the height of that window. Uh, Tracy's yeah. breaking out a pretty good-sized ladder to, yeah. to, to yeah, put that. And, and you have a situation like that where you, you really don't have a good place to lean the ladder. The, the, yeah. the ladder almost has to be leaned between the double windows and the um, the half window above it. And, ah, uh, 
Oh, yeah, that sounds tricky. <laughs> and, and, and then you're hauling the big uh, reef up there, and yeah, you're saying, right. honey, do you have to have this? Do you really want this up there this year? <laughs> and uh, so now he's going to be able to go back and say, hey, J- Joe and Danny said, I really can't hang that reef up there, honey. So um, <laughs> let's, let's, hang it, let's hang it on the front door. It'll be a lot yeah. safer. We, we didn't mention this, but once he gets this window taken apart to repair that grill, that sunshine ray looking grill, maybe you should just take it out entirely. Just take uh-huh. it out. You'll never know it was there, and you can hang his wreath right there from the inside. Maybe I don't know, but uh, yeah, I, I think you can get that fixed. But boy, you got to make sure it doesn't happen again. Hey, we want to hear from you and any of the challenges or questions or comments that you may have. We will listen and read every single one of them. You can send us an email anytime by going to todayshomeowner.com/ask. Or just pick up the phone, 800-946-4420 is the Today's Homeowner Hotline. We'd love to hear from you there as well. Right now, we're going to go to Ohio. Michael's on the line with a flooring question. Michael, welcome to the show, and tell us about this floor that you're uh, looking at here. Hi, glad to be with you. Uh, We have already put down new porcelain flooring planks, Mm -hmm. and I've been reading about them, and I'm wondering about the quality and durability over time. Well, I tell you what, it's a, uh, I'm looking at the picture of it. It certainly looks very nice. It looks like a cozy little den right there. And uh, I'll, I'll let um, Joe try to handle this because Joe um, wrote one of the best tile books around. And Joe, I know that you dove into the porcelain we did. Yeah. tiles a little bit. Uh, what, what did you come up with? And what would you say to Michael on this? Ordinarily, Michael, people will call us before they put down the floor. So now it's down. So it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> so, but the good news is, uh, and for listeners, Michael put down a um, porcelain tile plank floor. So these are porcelain tile, but they look like wood planks. And it's very, very popular. I mean, it was, it came out maybe like 20 years ago and they couldn't manufacture this quickly enough. And if you're going to put down a tile floor, it should be porcelain. People are still putting some ceramic tile floors down, but I would highly recommend only porcelain. Porcelain is much more durable. It's harder. It lasts a lot longer. It doesn't resist cracking as ceramic. Ceramic on walls is fine, but not on floors. So fortunately, you have a porcelain floor. As long as it was installed correctly with the right amount of mortar and it's supported properly underneath, this wears like iron and it wears as well as any other porcelain floor, whether it's square tiles or as opposed to these planks. Um, you know, like any tile, the grout joints are always the, the part that needs maintenance. But as long as you repair them as they crack or if they start to chip out or something like that. But the flooring itself is, you know, like I said, it wears like iron. So I think it's a really good choice for any room. It's, some people find it a little cold because they walk in, it looks like wood and it has a warm look. <laughs> then you walk across, it's like, why is this wood so cold? Well, because it's not wood. Right. Um, but, of course, you don't have to sand it or refinish it or anything. It doesn't stain hardly. The grout might, but this tile won't. So as long as it was installed correctly, and we don't know if it was, but let's assume it is, you're going to get you know decades of use out of this. How often would you suggest that I seal the floor? Well, you'd be sealing only the grout joints, and I would seal them maybe once a year particularly in areas where you're walking. I wouldn't be moving furniture out of the way to seal the grout joints. But once a year with a clear silicone, put it down with like an artist brush, a narrow artist brush, and just do the joints. But you wouldn't seal the tile itself? Nope, because it has a porcelain glaze, you know, it has a glaze over the porcelain body of the tile. So no, you shouldn't have to, I mean, you can clean it, obviously, like you clean any floor. Um, But yeah, no, you don't have to seal the, the tile itself. The only tile you seal is, stone tile or a clay tile that's unglazed I see. okay this project worked out very good it took a long time but it's now over and now we're trying to put the pieces back together well it looks great next time call us before you put down the floor <laughs> yeah i will do that <laughs> all right well it looks good michael you did a good job on it and taking that time to to seal that grouch you'll be glad you did in the years down the road but we appreciate yeah. you being a part of the show with us today all right Thank you very much. Take care. Okay, absolutely. Take care. Have a great weekend. I want to tackle a few emails here. And you know what? We'd love to get one from you. Today's homeowner.com slash ask is where you need to go to send us one straight to Joe and I. Here's one from Kurt in Indiana. We have a house that was built in the 50s with a front door that's smooth with one small window near the top. My wife wants to dress it up a bit with some molding. 
like she's done on some of the interior doors. I'm just concerned that it may not last with the moisture and temperature changes on the outside. What's the best way to attach the pieces so that they don't peel off in a year or two? Well, Kurt, I think it's a great idea. You can do an amazing job by putting a, you know, a cool geometric design that might look really good on the exterior. But first thing you want to make sure you're doing is to prime that wood well. Go ahead and prime the back side of it. Only takes a little bit. You're just trying to lock that moisture out, which is the most important part of it. And, and you know, the, the other thing you want to make sure you do is when you're attaching it, you're sanding that area just a little bit. It's almost like a cleaning process. And, you know, you need to do that for the paint, but also really helps the molding stick when you glue it. Now, to do that, you're going to want a wood glue that will retain its bond, even if it gets soaking wet. And Tight Bond 3 is the one for that. I just used some Tight Bond 3 just yesterday on some outdoor spindles that I built for a front porch. It'll be featured on the Today's Homeowner Television Show. And Tight Bond 3 is a perfect glue for this job because it's not only water resistant, but it's also waterproof. I mean, it holds like steel. I'm going to suggest that you tack the molding in place with just some little brad nails, you know, to kind of hold them in place while the glue dries. Wipe off any excess glue once it's dry and you're ready for a fresh coat of paint. To find out more about Tight Bond, you need to go by tightbond.com. We go by there all the time for a lot of the recommendations on their glues and adhesives, and you can find out more about Tight Bond 3. Again, tightbond.com. Right now, we're headed to Georgia to see if we can help Bobby. Bobby, welcome to the show, and tell us what's going on around your house there. Thank you. I built a pool about 20 years ago, and every year, the mold and mildew stain just keeps getting worse, and so about every three years, I have to turn around, pressure wash the pool deck. So I'm almost 70, and I would like to really clean it one more time and seal it with something that would prevent the mold and mildew. Okay, yeah, that can be frustrating. Of course, you have the the perfect elements for mold and mildew when you have that that you know the pool right there, and you have people getting in and out and so forth. Now you sent us a picture of it. I could see where you could spend a lot of time out there. That's a great looking a pool area, and I love the woods and so forth around it. I mean, first of all, I would go out and really pressure wash it. I mean, I'm talking about really clean it well. And I'll tell you, if you've never um, used one of the devices, this a round concentrated washer that hooks to your pressure washer that you push around on concrete, boy, those are pretty amazing. They have little brushes under them. You can rent them very, very inexpensively to hook to your pressure washer, and they're amazing how well they do on driveway sidewalks and the copings around the pool. So that would make it a little easier to get it nice and clean. Then allow it to dry. Hopefully you have some good drying conditions for a day or so there. And then use a masonry sealer. Now, a masonry sealer is clear. It's fairly inexpensive. You can put it in your pump-up garden sprayer and then just set it on spray and then just uh, apply one light coat over the entire surface. Read the directions. Normally, you can go right back with the second coat because what's happening here is your concrete is so porous that it's just soaking that water in. Then you're getting a cloudy day, you're getting sun, and all of a sudden the mold and mildew is going to grow like crazy. But if you seal it, and I would recommend putting three coats on, which uh, most masonry sealers you can do in one afternoon, then what's happening is your water is not going to soak down into it. Now, because the concrete uh, has a bit of a texture to it, it's not going to make it slick like it would if you put like a polyurethane on it. It's going to soak in. You'll still have the texture and the look of it. It's not going to change the look of the concrete much at all, but what it's doing is keeping that water from from soaking in. Joe, do you have some other suggestions for Bobby on this? I do, Bobby. But first, I want to make sure Danny is sitting down because what I'm about to say, I don't say too often, I agree with Danny entirely in this case. Oh. The, I'm tearing the, up the, now a little bit. I'll have to give me a clean it. The two things you absolutely need to do is clean it and then seal it. And since you don't, and I'm not sure I get, there's anything that allows you to do it just one more time. But um, since you've been doing this every couple of years and haven't been entirely satisfied with the results, I suggest you move up to an industrial product. And there are two, if you have pencil and paper handy, I'll give you a couple of uh, suggestions of products that I've used in the past that have worked great. There's a company called EnviroSafe. It's E-N-V-I-R-O, then the word safe, because these are all non-toxic. So they're really nice products and very effective. They make one called EnviroSafe 
algae and mildew cleaner, and you can brush it, roll it, spray it on, whatever. Works really effective. It's about $30 a gallon, and one gallon covers 300, 320 square feet, something like that. So you might need a couple of gallons. And then they make a companion product, EnviroSafe. It's called Trojan Masonry and Concrete Sealer. It's a little more expensive. It's a penetrating polyester sealer. It's about $43 a gallon. You get about 200 square feet of coverage. So I would move up to that. Last time I purchased them, I purchased them online from a company called EcoWares. It's E-C-O-W-A-R-E-S. I'm not sure where else you can find them. They probably sell them at um, industrial supply houses, but that, that's where I found it online. Might be available elsewhere. So that, that's what I would recommend. As Danny said, clean it really well and then put down this sealer. I don't remember how many coats they recommend, but if they recommend two, be sure to put down two. Okay. What do you think? I, I think we're going to go with that. Okay. All right, Bobby, I know it'll make a big difference. And, and plus, uh, we, we don't go anywhere. We want you to hang around and enjoy that pool for many, many years. And uh, and I think you'll enjoy it a lot more once you get all of this taken care of. It's it's not going to be that much of a project. And uh, maybe even get started on it this weekend. There you go. All right. Well, thanks so much, Bobby. And uh, best of luck on everything. And I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. And I hope you do the same. All righty. Thank, thank you very much. Right now, we're heading back to the Today's Homeowner Hotline. Elizabeth's on the line with us. Uh, Elizabeth, welcome to the show, and tell us what's going on around your house, and how can we help you? Well, I just bought a house, and it was built in 1979, and I understand that it has aluminum single-pane windows, and I'm wondering if I should replace them or what I should do, because I've heard different things about them. I've heard that you don't have to replace them. I've heard that you should replace them. I just need some advice on what to do and what's the best look and what's the best way to be energy efficient. Okay, great. That's that's a great question. And, and you know, a, a question like that is so good because there are thousands and thousands of people all across the country that have the same kind of question and you get a lot of different opinions and so forth and this is something that we've dealt with a lot uh, both in Joe and I's experience as well as uh, here on today's homeowner radio aluminum windows are kind of becoming obsolete and one of the main reasons is because of the heat transfer because of it transferring whatever a temperature you have on the outside to the inside it makes it a lot less efficient than other windows like wood or vinyl. So replacing them with vinyl windows, especially since your current windows are single pane. So going to a double pane window, which is completely standard now, going with a good quality vinyl window, which makes it virtually maintenance free and will not transfer that heat through and add to the value of the home. I would recommend really considering that. Now, here's the problem. With where we're sitting right now throughout the country with the supply and demand issue, some of the window companies are seven and eight months out on their orders. So that can be a little frustrating. So it might be that you want to talk with a couple companies, get some pricing, see what your budget needs to be, look at the different windows. They'll bring you a little sample window out, or even better, go to their showroom and look at it, and really ask all of the questions. How long will it take? I'll tell you another good thing is to go to Mm -hmm. a home that they recently installed some windows and just look up close and see how you like them. Open and close them. That's better than going to a showroom or seeing videos or anything else. And then you may want to wait a few months and and let this uh, cycle kind of catch up a little bit. All right. That sounds great. And so I'm wondering, since I live in a really warm, uh, moist climate, you know, near near the water, I'm wondering, so vinyl uh, double pane is the best solution, right? And they will last a long time. Yeah, they, they really will. And especially if you deal with a national company, there was a time, um, you know, a few years back where there were a lot of regional companies and some of the, the windows were not up to par. Um, that's kind of gone away now. And so the national companies have certain standards. All of them are not equal. Now, some are better than others. And they'll certainly tell you, they're, each and every one of them will tell you they're the best. So you have to wade through the marketing jargon a little bit. But um, talk to some people that have had windows um, okay. installed recently and nothing like going out there and uh, p- someone that spends money on their home um, and gets new windows, they're proud to show it off. You'll find people that will more than willing to let you come and check those out. And then if you don't feel comfortable with someone that comes out to your house, 
Don't do business with them. There's plenty of guys out there that are doing great work on installing good quality vinyl windows, and, and you'll be glad you did once you get that taken care of. All right, so I've got one more question. Can you give me a ballpark uh, about how, how much it would cost me to replace a large picture window? Oh, boy, it's all over the place on that uh-huh. price because, you know, if it's brick or if it's aluminum or different trim configurations on in, inside, I, I would like to, but I'm afraid I would uh, uh, okay. I wouldn't be giving you good information on that because it could be eight hundred dollars, it could be eighteen hundred dollars. So, wow, um, big, big, big stretch in between there. But, but get those estimates and uh, make sure that okay. you're kind of doing an apples to apples type of comparison when you're talking to the different companies, and uh, that'll make you comfortable when you decide to take care of it uh, once and for all. All right. Well, thank you so much. That is great advice. Thank you. Okay, our pleasure, Elizabeth. Um, best of luck on that window project, and uh, have a have a good weekend. We appreciate it. You know, that's one of the things, Joe. We hear that hear the same thing, and people, um, and and you know, you can get so confused when the, sure. the salesmen come out and they're, you know, and I'll, we always tell people if someone comes out and they're pushing you and pushing you and special deal and sign now right. yeah. and hey, we're working right around the corner. Um, no, uh-uh. no, let let the red flag open the front door point to the car and say bye bye don't don't <laughs> don't don't succumb to the pressure of a salesman yeah and with vinyl windows you're right there's so many it used to be it was hard to find a really quality vinyl window but nowadays even major manufacturers are making really good vinyl windows so and the two things we say you always should look for is a nice thick beefy frame around the outside of the window outside mm-hmm. the sash themselves that are have a lot of channels in them that trap air and you want the corners to be welded. Now, it's not truly a weld, but it's like a fused together as opposed to just being clamped or screwed together or something like that. So where the at the corner of the joints, the corner joints around the frame itself, they should be welded. You want, a, and, and again, a nice thick frame. You don't want a really thin frame. And the sash themselves should operate smoothly. And if you like the look of real wood, but you want the... Um, on the interior, but you want the protection of vinyl, you can get vinyl clad windows. Anderson makes a great one. It's, it's in a wood window with vinyl cladding on the outside. So that, that's another option. Well, I tell you what, they are getting so good. The installers, you know, the um, replacement windows have been out for a long, long time. And the experienced installers that are out there are pretty darn amazing that um, they can come and they can remove that window, put another window in, do just a little bit of caulking on the inside and outside, which is extremely important. And hopefully, when they're uh, just before they put the window in, hopefully they're insulating and foaming any area they possibly can because you won't get another chance to do it. But it's pretty amazing how they'll, and you know, the, like I say, the good ones, they have the drop cloths, they have pads that walk in and out of your house to minimize the damage. And end of the day, you're looking around going, wow, that's just like a magician yeah, right. in how they've been able to remove, put it in, caulk. And immediately, now people talk about energy efficiency, people talk about low maintenance, but one thing that everybody that get goes from single pane windows to double pane windows realize all of a sudden, you don't hear that car anymore. All of a sudden, That's those right. kids yeah. out those those rascal kids out there hollering <laughs> on the street, you don't you you don't hear that. So the soundproofing aspect of it is really significant and a big benefit. Also keeps the dust out of your house. I'd be surprised how much dust blows through. A, not only when it's blowing through air, it's also blowing through dust. And yeah. Elizabeth didn't mention how many windows she has, but you don't have to do them all at once either. If you have twenty right. windows that are replaced, you don't have to do them all. I mean, I'd certainly start with the front of the house. Um, and do you know as much as you can, but you can do four or five windows at a time. Yeah, you don't have to do it all at once. Here's another email from Sandra in Battle Creek, Michigan. I have moss on my roof and was told to spray it with straight vinegar and a pump-up garden sprayer. Then I heard it's best to dilute the vinegar with water. Then I heard 10% bleach and 90% water. <laughs> What do you suggest to kill the moss? Also, I'm not sure about climbing up and down those ladders. So is there some contractor that actually cleans the roofs? Boy, this is another example, Joe, of uh, sometimes you get too much 
information, That's especially right. when it's yeah. conflicting a little bit. But uh, tell Sandra the right way to go about trying to minimize that moss on a roof. Yeah, that's a good question. What type of contract would you call? I'm not really sure. I guess you can call a roofer, and if he doesn't do it, maybe there's a handyman. But well, there, yeah, there's there services. All, yeah, there's services there out there. I don't know how services? you know how widespread they are, but I, yeah. I see you know roof cleaning services that uh, have a special oh, way of okay. doing it, and apparently have a a love for getting up on the roof. So yeah, that's, well, you live in the southeast where there's probably a lot of moss and a lot of humidity and moisture things growing on roofs more than up in New England. But she's in Michigan, so first I suspect she might want to trim back some branches it sounds like there's not enough sunshine hitting this roof which will help cut down on the amount of moss and algae but i think i would skip the homemade and i'm a big proponent of using a homemade solution but here you're talking about getting up on a roof so i would just try there are several commercial products one's called moss out uh, wet and forget has one called outdoor extreme and the great thing about these products is they hook up to a hose so you don't have to i mean unless this is a really tall house chances are you can do it from the ground the bottle screws right out to the end of your hose i think it sprays about 25 30 feet covers about 2,000 square feet because these are concentrates and it's, it's relatively affordable i think you can get two 48 ounce bottles for about 60 bucks or so so that, that's what i would suggest is using any kind of spray to put this product on the roof and just be real real careful when you don't want to get up on a wet roof and i agree no, with joe no. on some of those recommendations hey joe we're going to shift gears a little bit send it over to joe truini for our simple solution joe what do you have for us all right danny this time of year a lot of people are maintaining their gutters and trying to make sure they're cleaned out and working properly so if your gutters are sagging well let me be let me clarify that if the gutters on your house are sagging you <laughs> notice a section of rain gutter is pulled away chances are the spikes that hold the gutter in place have pulled free from the fascia board. Most gutters are just nailed up with these long aluminum spikes that go through the front of the gutter and through what's called a ferrule, which is inside the gutter. It's basically just a tube of aluminum, and that allows them to hammer those in without crushing the gutter. But in any case, that's a notoriously weak connection. And over a long winter, you get wet leaves and snow, whatever, it pulls those spikes free. So a lot of people go up there when they're cleaning the gutter, just hammer them back in. But guess what? That's not going to hold very well because it's already been pulled out of that hole once. So what you want to do is replace it with a long structural screw. They used to be called landscaping screws, but they changed the name of them. And anyway, it just basically looks like a long, narrow lag screw almost. And they come in various lengths, 8, 10, 12 inches, usually 8 or 10 inches, plenty long enough. And you can just run them in. Now, if you run it in and it spins a little bit, it means the hole is stripped out. So all you have to do is just pull it out, move it over like just a quarter of an inch and just drive it through the same hole. It might be at a little bit of an angle, but it'll go in. And those screws really hold. I've replaced, I think, almost every spike in my whole gutter system. So that's what we're trying to do, replace those spikes with screws. You know, and Joe, you're right. A lot of time over the years, you know, the gutters will settle, they'll shift. You're just not yep. quite sure they're doing their job until you get up there. And when you're doing this kind of thing, you know, and take the time, you know, after the, you know, the leaves are um, hopefully close to being finished uh, falling for a little bit and you can clean that gutter really really good you know you want to use gloves you want to be careful on the ladder particularly don't reach out too far and so forth i also have shown many times on um, the weather channel and different other uh, shows where you can take an antifreeze jug and actually kind of take a, a razor knife and shape a gutter scoop it's perfect right. to yep. scoop down in there and get the debris out and once you get it nice and clean and you can get your ladder in a position there get a water hose, put a little water in that gutter, and make sure that water's going where it's supposed to go That's to right. the downspout. And sometimes you'll you'll realize, well, well, water's sitting over here. And then while you're repairing your gutter and adjusting your gutter, you might be able to lift that up a little bit when you're putting the screw in that Joe mentioned and correct that fall in it. A very, very simple, easy. You don't even need a, a, a level or any instrument. The water will tell you if it's going where it needs to go. Just a few little tweaks on your gutters there will make it work a whole lot better year round. Because if you have gutters, they're there for a reason. They may as well work as efficiently as possible. And uh, keeping them clean is an extremely important part of maintaining your home. We'd love to hear from you on any question or comment that you may have about the Today's Homeowner podcast. Again, it's todayshomeowner.com slash podcast to leave us any comment at all. And again, as always, thank you so much for the great reviews. We continue getting. We love doing what we're doing, and we appreciate you taking some time to let us know that you do as well. I'm Danny Lifford, along with my buddy Joe Truini. Thanks so much for listening to this Today's Homeowner Podcast.